Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dima Schlichtenko. I'm the director of IPAM. Uh, IPAM is the Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics here at the UCLA campus. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you to our first uh, Green Family Lecture of 2020. So a couple of words about IPAM and a couple of words about Green Family Lectures and about our lecture. So IPAM is the Institute for Pure and Applied Math, as I just said. It's one of several NSF-funded mathematics institutes in the United States. Um, IPAM uh, is going to be celebrating its 20th anniversary this year, and so all of you are welcome to come by when we will have some public event. And since we are a math institute, we couldn't avoid doing some numerology and decided to do it on 10-20-2020. That is October, what did I say, October 20th, 2020, right? Uh, and it will be the 20th anniversary of IPAM, as I said. Um, um, IPAM uh, seizes its mission to connect mathematics with other sciences. So we run programs of various kinds that are designed to build communities of mathematicians and uh, people from other areas of uh, science. Uh, that could be physical sciences, could be even social sciences, could be medical sciences, uh, that want to come together and use mathematics to crack, crack hard problems. Um, we have a workshop right now uh, at IPAM, and uh, many of you are attendees of that workshop. Um, IPAM also runs long programs. It also runs a number of student-oriented programs, including our summer research program here at UCLA, also in Singapore, uh, in Berlin, and Japan. And these are aimed both at undergraduate students, and some are aimed at graduate students. Um, I would also like to um, mention Mark Green in this connection. Mark Green has been the founding director of IPAM, and uh, Mark has been instrumental in getting IPAM to be the institute it is today. Uh, Mark and his family gave a very generous donation uh, in 2012, I believe, that has endowed uh, a lecture series known as the Green Family Lecture Series. And this uh, lecture series is designed to bring to the UCLA campus and to IPAM uh, the most preeminent uh, mathematically related minds of today. And we've had a, a wonderful list of people that have given lectures, uh, many of whom are, uh, have won Nobel Prizes, Fields Medals, and uh, things of that nature. So uh, the Green Family Lectures are, are now twice a year, uh, thanks to uh, Mark and his family's generosity. Uh, and there will be another Green Family Lecture coming up, uh, I believe in May, uh, with uh, Alessio Figali, a recent Fields Medalist, giving a talk. But coming back to today, um, our speaker today is uh, Jill Mezerov. She is uh, Vice Chancellor for, uh, I believe it's Computational uh, Medicine at um, University of California, San Diego. She is a mathematician, uh, but her uh, latest work is, is uh, concerns applications of mathematics in medicine. And as you see, the title of her talk today relates to how mathematics can be used in uh, genomics and, uh, and cancer research. Uh, Jill has had many, many honors. Uh, she has been elected um, a member, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, she's been elected as the inaugural uh, member of the American Mathematical so Association and the Association of Women in Mathematics, as well as the International Society for Computational uh, Biology. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce Jill Mezerov. Thank you so much. And while she's coming here, I just wanted to give big thanks to everybody uh, who uh, worked so hard to put together the lectures, both IPAM staff uh, and uh, uh, IPAM scientific directorate and the organizers of the workshop. Thank you so much. Okay. Sure. So I think I'm using this. Yes. And so I'm going to move this out of my way. I don't mind. And I want to thank Dima for this wonderful invitation. I wish I were not quite uh, as um, challenged in speaking as I am, but I'm going to do my best. And I also want to give my thanks to, to Mark for, found, for um, his family founding this wonderful lecture series to try and bring the beauty of mathematics to all these different fields and, and to all of you. Um, <clears throat> so I, I now describe myself more as a computational biologist than I do as a mathematician. I'm, I'm not a medical doctor, as you can see. My PhD is indeed in mathematics, uh, but I found my calling in biomedical research. I study cancer, 
and I lead the research program in genomics at the Morse Cancer Center at UCSD. Um, and how did I make this transition from doing nonlinear differential equations to trying to solve problems in biomedicine? You may well ask. Um, in the late uh, 80s, <coughs> I was um, directing the mathematical sciences research group in a high performance computing company called Thinking Machines Corporation. It went bankrupt in 1995, but that's another whole story. Um, and one day, a mathematician walked in, another mathematician, and that was Eric Lander. You uh, may have heard his name as he was a key uh, person in the Human Genome Project. And when <laughs> Thinking Machines went bankrupt, I was lucky enough uh, that uh, Eric, uh, who had been a collaborator of mine in the ensuing years, asked me if I wanted to join him at what was then the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research, uh, what is now the Broad uh, Institute of Harvard and MIT, to be involved in the Human Genome Project. Uh, and that was really an exciting time. I mean, the sequencing of the human genome really opened the door for a lot of the impact of genomics in medicine today. And to have been a part of that project and to be able to use my both mathematical and computational expertise to move that project forward, that was an opportunity that not many people have. And the goal really of the Human Genome Project, uh, which was finished in uh, 2003, so that was the 50th anniversary of the Watson Crick discovery of the structure of DNA, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> The goal was to really to try and better understand underlying molecular mechanisms of human disease and to use that knowledge to improve treatment. And I like to think that that's really the goal of what my research still is today, to understand the underlying mechanisms of disease and to use that knowledge to try and better treat patients of cancer. Okay, so this is all of the uh, biology that you need to know uh, for this um, talk. It's called The Central Dogma. We have approximately 37 trillion cells in our bodies. Each cell has a nucleus, and in the nucleus are 23 chromosomes. We inherit them from our father and our mother, and we get tra traits from both of them. The chromosomes are made up of DNA, which is curled around itself. Uh, and, but what really catalyzes all of the biochemical reactions in our body, what are, what's really the building blocks of life are the proteins. And how, having a little bit of trouble with this baby, ah, and how do those proteins go, come about? Well, they come from the genes, which are really just programs inside our DNA. Those genes express what's called messenger RNA, the messenger RNA is a template. I'm going to use my mouse. The messenger RNA is a template, and that template tells the amino acids which were, are floating around in the cell how to build the thing which is the protein. And then again, the proteins are those building blocks, and they're what really make us work. <clears throat> so that's the end of the biology part of this lecture, except that I thought you'd like to see what a gene looks like. This is, this is a gene. This is actually the so-called cystic fibrosis gene. It's the gene that's related to um, people getting the disease cystic fibrosis. And one little mistake in the spelling of a gene can cause muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis, or even cancer. So for example, since that was the cystic fibrosis gene, that gene has about 230,000 base pairs, so these A, T, Cs, and Gs. And the most common mutation which causes uh, cystic fibrosis is a deletion of these three base pairs, which means that a certain amino acid is missing when the protein is built. And that's what causes cystic fibrosis. And that only has to happen to one of the copies of this gene inside your DNA, because we each have two copies of each gene, those are called the alleles, one from daddy, one from mommy. Okay. So 
the Human Genome Project did a lot of things. And one of the things the Human Genome Project did was to have a profound effect on the technology that's used to sequence those genomes. And you can see here how the amount of sequence we've been producing since, well, I started in about 1997, which was the beginning of this technology re re revolution, up to about 2003 when the human genome was released. Look at it through 2006. We can see that's a pretty steep curve, but then it gets even steeper. Whoopsie. Then it gets even steeper there from 2006 to 2009 and then into 2010. And the point is that in another four years or so, we're going to have something like a zettabyte of sequence that we've acquired. That's a lot of sequence. If you put that sequence on DVDs and you stack them one on top of the other, they would go, I keep going the wrong way here, they would go halfway to the moon. That's a lot of data, a lot of data. But the question is, what do we want to do with all that data? You know, people talk about big data, big data, big data. It's one thing to have big data. It's another thing to do something meaningful with that data. And so that's what we really want to do. We want to go from data to knowledge. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you about this today. Because the same disease in different patients, the thing we call the same disease in any case, can often have very different clinical behavior. And the question is, how do we acquire and integrate all the different kinds of data that we can acquire now to help us understand, once again, we go back to the mechanisms, underlying molecular mechanisms of disease, and then to better customize the treatment of disease for individual patients. Lest you think this is a new idea, it's one of my favorite quotes over here. So Celsus lived in like the first century AD. And what he says is, no one, however, except for time and experiment, can have the skill to distinguish cacothes, which admits of being treated, from a carcinoma, which does not. In other words, he's talking about stratifying patients on what the outcome, what their outcome will be to a treatment regimen. So this is an old problem, and we're still working on it today. Now, again, because of all this technology that we have now, it's not only gotten us a lot more data, but it's much cheaper to get that data. So it cost about something like $100 million to sequence the human genome originally, and now we can sequence genomes from, for a couple of thousand dollars depending on how deeply, what we, we say deeply, we want to sequence those genomes. And what that means was, is that starting in around 2006, there have been over 20,000 tumors, patient tumors that have been sequenced, and made publicly available for researchers like me to use in their work, 20,000 tumors. And part of the challenge of doing that work was actually to get the tumors from the patients. That was almost the hardest part of it. And this doesn't include the clinical sequencing that's being done now of patient tumors, because those are not necessarily released publicly. And that can be another challenge in the work we do. So why isn't the problem solved? Well, the problem isn't solved because there's this heterogeneity. Mutations are rare. They vary across different tumors, even of the same type, they certainly vary across different tumor types. The variants in breast cancer look different than the variants in colon cancer look different from the variants in lung cancer. But if you take two patients, both of whom have lung cancer, their tumors may have very different variants too. So there's a lot of heterogeneity across tumors, tumor cells, and patients. And that makes it hard to do this kind of work Nonetheless, there's been some progress, and this, this is work that was done even before the human genome was released. And so we didn't have all these tumor sequences that we could use. And one case was that about 10% of lung cancer patients responded to a drug called um, Eressa. 
I always have trouble with these inib drug names, pronouncing them, gefitinib. Um, and only 10% of patients responded. And in fact, that was linked to a mutation in the EGFR gene, in one gene. All right. Now, in melanoma, a kind of similar thing was found, namely in a gene called BRAF, a mutation was identified in many melanoma tumors, and a particular inhibitor was developed in about 2010, so that took almost 10 years, called, uh, here I go again, Vermurumab, yes, okay? And so here's a patient. You see all these melanoma tumors here. And 15 weeks later, wow, look at that. Targeted therapy gets rid of all that melanoma. Are we done? Anybody want to guess? Are we done? No, we are not done, or I wouldn't be giving this talk. Um, so about eight weeks later, look what happened. All these tumors came back, most of them in the same place that the original tumor was. So what does that tell you? That tells you that resistance is a problem, that tumors respond to drugs, and then they become resistant to drugs, and we don't always understand why. So once again, I just want to go back to this slide and remind you about this challenge of heterogeneity. So because of that challenge of heterogeneity, and because even if we know what the variant is and we treat it, that might not be enough. We might get resistance and the tumor may come back. I'm telling you now that DNA sequence is not enough to solve the problems of cancer. We need to know more than just the variants in the tumor's DNA, in the tumor's structural or genetic makeup. And that, in fact, what we need to add to that is what, what I call functional data, which is the activation of all these genes and proteins that I was talking about at the beginning, right? Whether they're upregulated, downregulated, whether they're active, whether they're so-called repressed, and so on. And to combine all of that additional information with clinical data, data about the patients, we call it phenotype often, and previous knowledge, things that have been known. And what are we going to do with all of that? We're going to better understand underlying molecular mechanisms of disease to enable us to do better diagnosis and understand which patients might respond to treatment better. and <laughs> excuse me, and then of course to make, to make all of that work help us find new therapies that might work even better. So mechanism, clinical care, new therapies. And to do that, we need to go from all that big data to these goals that we care about. We need mathematical models and computation to make some sense and get some knowledge out of all that big data. OK. And how do we do that? Well, one of the techniques that we use very heavily is something called machine learning. So machine learning is actually something that's been used in the marketing and financial fields for a long time and sort of came over into biology once we had a lot more data that we could mine with it. And the idea is, can we find patterns in large data sets? So what can I say about all the people who rent Star Wars movies? And can I use that to learn something about other movies and products those people are about, uh, might buy? And maybe what other customers in my marketing database are likely to rent science fiction? So this is kind of a targeted marketing problem. You know, when I started giving these, this talk, I used to talk about targeted um, things that you would get from like Land's End. You know, I used to get this, what are those? That we, nobody gets those things anymore. I had catalogs, right? You would get a targeted catalog. Like, I always got a targeted catalog for cashmere. What can I tell you? Nice and soft, nice and warm, you know. But you might get targeted catalog for ski equipment or whatever, right? So that's what they were doing. They were doing essentially what we're calling machine learning now. 
And in cancer, the kind of two cat classification problems that we consider. First, we want to try and identify previously unrecognized classes of tumors at the molecular level. And then we want to take new tumors and be able to place them in, in classes that we've already characterized or classified. So the first is called class discovery or unsupervised learning. The second, class prediction or supervised learning we use to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> okay. So what does this mean um, in bi for biomedicine? It means we want to gather data, whether it's genomic data, medical data, and so forth. We want to label it. We might label it according to some phenotypic or clinical data that we have, or we might want to do some class discovery and label it that way ourselves. Then we want to train a model to learn something so that we can then make predictions about what the patient has, whether the patient will, will respond to therapy, and, and maybe even to be able to see how people responding to different drugs mean better treatments for individual patients. So I'm going to tell you a story now. And that story is about the first machine learning project I did in cancer. And it was to identify subtypes of leukemia at the molecular level. So what you're looking here are, at here are histology slides of acute myeloid leukemia and acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And um, can anybody tell the difference? This is going to be a quiet audience, right? Um, they look pretty similar, don't they? They, yeah, well, yeah, some are smush, some are great, but they look pretty different, right? Okay. So, they are different. Um, so that was what we wanted to know. So, first of all, the difference between lymphoblastic and myeloid leukemia took about 20 years of basic science research, and it was done by a guy named Sidney Farber. You may have heard of him because of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in uh, Boston, very famous guy, and he was the first person to treat kids who had leukemia with chemicals, so chemotherapy. And the reason it's important to know whether someone has acute lymphoblastic or acute myeloid leukemia is because they have very different treatment regimens. One, a long chemotherapy regimen followed by cranial radi radiation. The other, a short chemotherapy regimen followed by a bone marrow transplant. So you really have to know the difference. And people could tell the difference. There, there were a number of um, clinical tests that were used to distinguish the two types of leukemia. Morphology, somebody pointed out they, they look more squished together and they look more separate, right? That's called morphology. Immunohistochemistry, so that's staining slides to see if certain genes are expressed in one or the other. Immunoph <clears throat> immunophenotyping and cytogenetics, so a bunch of different things were used. And, but it took some expert interpretation by gifted pathologists and errors still occurred. And we were asking the question, OK, could we do this at the molecular level? So if we looked at the expression level of all the genes in a patient who had leukemia, could we tell if he had or she had acute myeloid or acute lymphoblastic leukemia? That was the question we asked. And we asked that in about 1997. So this is some early work at the birth of this kind of work. So this is what the data looks like. Um, I'm going to show it to you this way, although sometimes I kind of flip this array around in later slides, and you'll forgive me for that. But red means a gene is very active. Blue means it's repressed, not so active. Each one of these um, columns represents a different gene, and each one of these rows represents a sample from a different patient. OK? What is that? Oh, you mathematicians in the audience. 
It's a matrix, right? See, all I do is linear algebra. I get to deal with linear algebra all the time. OK, so here it is. These are real patient samples. ALL at the top, AML at the bottom. These are the genes that are most highly associated with up regulation or activity in ALL. And these are the genes who are more active in AML. Okay? And there are 25 of each of them. So if I now show you a patient's data, is that AML or ALL? Come on, some, all of you. Come on. What is it? AML, excellent. And what about this guy? Same, AML. And what about this guy? You've just learned to distinguish based on these 50 genes who's got AML and who's got ALL, right? So now I'm telling you that I can do that. I can teach a computer to do that. The same way that you just learned to do it with those labeled samples, I can teach a computer to do that, and that's what we did. So given all these, these are all the AML samples, these are all the things that are probably ALL patients, done. So <clears throat> we built a predictor. We used three different machine learning techniques. <coughs> they all were 100% accurate. Right? Um, and in fact, if we threw away all the labels and we just clustered the samples, we divided the patient population into T cell ALL, B cell ALL, and AML. So we could rediscover those classes. Now, this was our first project of this sort, and we were like super excited about it. What we didn't understand at the time was that the signal in this data was like super strong. I once had a colleague say to me, I could tell, you know, you know, I can, I can name that song in five notes. I can name that song in four notes. He claimed, I can name that leukemia in one gene. I don't know if he could do it with one gene, but, but it's certainly true that almost any machine learning algorithm you threw at this data, the signal was, there were hundreds and hundreds of genes that were very closely associated with AML or with ALL. And that made this an easier problem. We didn't know at the time that that was going to be the case, but that turned out to be the case. Now I'm going to come forward a few years and tell you a somewhat longer story about precision medicine at work. And I'm going to tell you this story about a similar kind of problem where the signal is not so easy to see where the signal is not so strong. So for the, last, for the last 20 years, I've been working on a pediatric brain tumor called medulloblastoma. This is a pretty devastating disease, I want to tell you. And although 65 or 70 percent of patients survive what's called standard of care treatment. The treatment involves radiating the brain and the spine of uh, very young children. And what you might imagine is that there are quite severe neurological and um, developmental problems that arise in most of these children who survive. They survive, but their quality of life may not be the best. And in fact, only about 10% of those who survive will go on to lead independent lives. So the ability to titrate treatment, that is to figure out which of these children are going to respond well to the standard of care, and which of them are not going to respond as well to the standard of care, might enable us to titrate their treatment somewhat, right? So that it would be less harsh. The other thing is that maybe we should be so lucky as to find ways to treat this disease 
which would be less harmful to the child. And these are mostly kids. There are some adult patients too, but it's mostly kids, you know. Okay, so um, as I said, this, this work started for me about 20 years ago. We had a cohort of about 60 patients, um, and we did the same thing we did with the AML, ALL study, right? We labeled, this is, this is what's called a class vector. It's as high as you can go here for activated gene and as low as you can go here for repressed gene. And then we sort the genes by how uh, close they are, how correlated we are with that class, what's called class vector. And we're dividing these things here into relapse and non-relapse. So that's the phenotype we're looking at. And here was the problem. There were no genes that were significantly correlated with this relapse, no relapse phenotype. So that means that there was nobody closer than you might expect at random from the number of genes that we look at, which are about 20,000 of them. All right. So this is pretty disappointing. But what the hell? We'll try anyway. And so we built a, a classifier, predictor of outcome. Um, and we used uh, 10 genes from the no relapse type and 10 genes from the relapse type. And you can see them here. You can see they're not as strong as the ones were for the AML, ALL case, too. And then we did something which is called cross-validation. Uh, and, and let me tell you what cross-validation means. It means you take two samples out of your what's called cohort, out of the patients, one from each phenotype, OK? And then you build your model, you build your predictor, and then you try and predict what those two patients are. Are they relapse or non-relapse? And you know the answer because you have that data, right? And you do that again and again and again and again. That's called cross-validation. And then you say, OK, well, how often was I right and how often was I wrong? And the answer was, well, I'm accurate about 78% of the time in to, to tell you whether it's relapse or non-relapse. And that actually turns out to be better than um, the clinical prognosis at the time for patients, which basically depended on their histology and whether the tumors had metastasized or not. But there's a problem here. This is a perfect example of what we in the biz call overtraining, right? Um, we didn't have an independent validation set to test this on. And in fact, when we started doing that, this predictor doesn't generalize at all. It works great on this one set where we did all the work and we had all the same patients and of course they were all treated the same way. That's, that's a given, right? So it doesn't work very well and there's no insight into therapy or mechanism. Okay, so what next? Well, we don't give up. So the first thing we do is we say, well, one thing we need is we need to get more samples and we need to find out why the signal is not very strong here. What's the problem here? Why are we not having a strong signal? So over the next five years, we gathered a larger cohort of about 300 samples. And we clustered the expression data to uncover right the different molecular subtypes of medulloblastoma. <coughs> right? That's the class discovery piece. And um, by the way, here's, here's the matrix again. This time, the rows are the genes and the columns are the samples, or the tumors. And uh, the way we like to cluster things is we use a matrix factorization method called non-negative matrix factorization. I'm not going to bore you with the details of it. If you want to see that, you have to come on Wednesday. Um, but uh, again, it's all matrices. I have a very uh, good friend and colleague uh, from when I was at the Broad who says that all the time, you know. Computational biology is just about matrices. 
It's a bit of an exaggeration, but that's okay. So what we found was that there were six different molecular subtypes. And you can see that there's still some heterogeneity in there, in that uh, pink and blue gram, right? But, um, but there, there are six different subtypes. This one is fairly homogeneous. It happens to be the one where the so-called Wnt pathway is activated. But the, the other ones are a little bit heterogeneous. And if you look, you can see there, there's some similarities between C1 and C5 and C2 and C4. And um, I'm going to talk more about that tomorrow. Um, so you can come tomorrow and see what that, what's going on there. Uh, so six subtypes. So then we said, OK, let's see what the survival curves look like for these six subtypes. And here they are. So this is event-free survival, overall survival. So the y-axis is the percentage of patients who are still alive, right? And the x-axis is time. And lo and behold, what do you see? Each subtype has its very different survival profile. And not only that, but this C1 subtype is really driving the poor outcome. And in fact, the signal that we were probably picking up in our previous study was that signal. We just didn't kind of know it. And so it occurs to us that since outcome varies by subtype, maybe if we build our model to do the prediction, taking subtype into account, we can improve our predictive power. So that's, that's, that was the idea. And of course, what I'm showing you here is not really prediction. It's just association. But um, the other thing is, that this C1 subtype, which is characterized biologically by something called CMIC amplification, is actually that it's called the CMIC driven subtype. Um, here it is, MIC driven. Um, what we want to do is think about is there a way that we can maybe find new treatment regimens for that worst case? Okay? So that's the idea. All righty. So the first issue was the differing outcome by subtype. But the second was this problem we, we had about not having strong associations of individual genes with the phenotype that we cared about, which was relapse or not relapse, right? OK. Well, why is that? I'm giving you a real hint here, right? <laughs> the reason for that is that in mathematics, we say genes are not independent variables. Genes are dependent variables. They don't act as individuals independent of each other. They act at the level of pathways, other coherent sets of genes, and processes. Right? So by using individual genes as the so-called features in our predictor, or the variables, we're kind of not taking into account the fact that they're not independent. And maybe we can get more signal out of the noise in the data by considering these pathways or processes instead of the individual genes and boost the signal. And I, I have to tell you that, that this insight said about 10 years of other research in my lab, which I'm not going to talk about today. But again, if you come Wednesday, you can hear a little bit more about that. So again, we want to improve stratification of high and low risk patients. And this time, what we decided to do was to integrate five different data types, clinical, two clinical, and three molecular data types. And to identify and leverage the differences in the six molecular subtypes that we found in our cohort, and also to use pathways and signatures, not just for biological treatment and insights, but also to boost that signal in the noise, to get a stronger signal. And 
we did this using a, a Bayesian machine learning algorithm, which I'm not going to describe today. But again, I, I will describe that on, on Wednesday. Um, and what happened was that we actually got much better accuracy. The model fit was better. And the accuracy of the model was better. But more importantly, someone that we knew in Germany was willing to give us a validation independent test set. Now, I cannot tell you how hard it is in my business to get people to give you their data, especially if they haven't published it yet, um, to do this kind of validation. But Marcel Kuhl, bless his soul, gave us an independent test set. And our predictor generalized beautifully on that independent patient cohort. The other thing that we observed was that of the 15 patients who were clinically classified as low risk patients but went on to relapse, our predictor actually called them high risk patients. So we rescued 40% of those patients, which were called low risk, but were really high risk. Right? And also, because we can characterize these subtypes by the pathways that are activated in them and what, what biology is involved, then that could lead to treatment. And I'm going to talk about that in, in just a minute. And obviously, this kind of method can apply to other tumor types. OK. So the next thing I want to talk about is, what can we do about trying to find a new compound, a new treatment regimen for this worst outcome case. <clears throat> and this is a kind of interesting story where we combined different kinds of disease models, computational analysis, and public data, big data, um, to really do that. And we, we call the method discover. And we started out with a cell line model of this activation of this gene CMYK, or MYK that you heard of. And then we implanted those cells into the mouse of a brain, and tumors grew. And then the question is, well, what are those tumors? Are they the same kind of tumors that we're interested in finding a treatment for? And the answer is, well, first we have to take those tumors out of the mouse. We have to profile their gene expression. And then we want to extract the signature of those tumors. And then what we did was to say, well, do these tumors, these extracted signatures, do they look anything like the signatures we know of from the medulloblastoma cohort that we studied before? And lo and behold, they look just like that C1 cohort. And for those of you in the crowd who, who are mathematicians, we do this with an inflammation theoretic metric to do the association. And we use that again to associate the signatures of the cells with their viability or their sensitivity to drugs. And this is big public data. So we use two different expression of cell lines databases and three different compound screens which tell us about compound sensitivity of the same cell lines. And we use this, close your ears if you don't know what this means, information theoretic metric to do the comparison, because we're trying to compare apples and oranges here a little bit. OK, so what might be the next step? I mean, you know, we said, OK, this signature looks like CDK inhibitor sensitivity. Now what? Oh, come on. All right, so I've got a drug that inhibits CDK. I have a bunch of them from these databases. And what do I do with it? Use it in the mouse cell. Thank you. Use it in the mouse. So I want to treat that poor mouse with the CDK inhibitor. And um, in fact, it turns out that uh, that was successful. So that was the real validation. Um, it extended the, the life of these mice by about 20%. That doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a start. Um, so we see that this works 
in mice, the question is, will it work in humans? So there's been a lot of subsequent work um, studying these kinds of CDK inhibitors for this particular subtype of medulloblastoma. Remember, it's that C1 worst outcome case. And I just actually heard two weeks ago that a new clinical trial is being promulgated at St. Jude's Hospital with ribocyclib, which is a CDK4 and CDK6 inhibitor from Novartis. And the reason that they're using this drug, ribocyclib, is that it actually gets through the blood-brain barrier. That's one of the problems with trying to treat brain cancer is you got to get through this barrier to the brain. OK. So I want to kind of get to the climax here, which is how do we try and translate this, all this stuff I've been explaining to you to the clinic? So it turns out we are taking this discover approach that I described to you. And we're using it at, in the Molecular Tumor Board at Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego to try to <laughs> identify candidate compounds that oncologists can consider using on the kids that they bring to the tumor board. And, and I have to tell you, when I got my PhD in mathematics, I won't tell you how long that ago that was. It's kind of embarrassing. If somebody had told me then that I would be sitting in a molecular tumor board and trying to help treat young children who have brain tumors, I would have thought you were crazy. But here I am, a simple mathematician. So one of the first patients that we discussed uh, was a five-year-old. They're young. Uh, it was in August, came to the tumor board. The histology, that means what type of tumor this was, was inconclusive. However, by doing expression, oh, and I should say there were no actionable variants. So DNA didn't help us, of the tumor didn't help us at all. There was nothing that was obviously uh, mutated that could be targeted. So what we did was we got expression data for that tumor. And using that discover approach that I described to you, we identified the subtype of the tumor, and we also um, <laughs> proposed some compounds that that child could be treated with. Another example of the application of discover was this 13-year-old patient. Um, this is really sad. I mean, I, I have to tell you, the days I sit on the tumor board, they are really sad days for me. Um, these, these kids don't come to us until they've relapsed a number of times. And the outlook for them, no matter what we suggest, is not good. Um, nonetheless, the hope is that we make a difference at this stage, which then can be used at the primary stage or the, state, the time of diagnosis. So here, this was a 13-year-old patient, an older patient, who was first diagnosed in April of 2015. They did a subtotal resection, so they didn't take out the whole tumor. And the histology was an atypical central neurocytoma. You can see six months later, the tumor progressed. Uh, they did a full resection at that time, and you can see where this tumor is. It's that black mess over there. Um, and then they treated uh, him with x-rays. Um, and then uh, about six months later, he progressed again, was treated with Avastin. And then he hung in for about a year and a half until he recurred again. And once again, there were no actionable variants. So we used the DISCOVER approach on the expression uh, profile of this patient's tumor. And what we found were these BRAF inhibitors coming up at the top of the list of proposed drugs. And so the therapy that was chosen was based, based on DISCOVER was an RTK inhibitor with um, BRAF B600 activity, which is what had shown up on the list. Now, <laughs> this is not an official clinical trial yet. This is not at the level of an official clinical trial. I always try and make that clear in my talks. 
um, what happens is we, we run the disco discover, we give the oncologists a list of what are the top candidates that come out of the algorithm. And they consider them given the additional things that they know about uh, the clinical data, about the patient, about the drugs, and so on. So there's, a, there's no magic here. There's a lot of other things going on. So to date, we've done 29 of these cases. <coughs> Excuse me. And the 30th is going to be done this Friday. Um, we meet once a month to review these kids. And uh, it's, I don't know, it's just, it's heartrending. It's really heartrending. So let's change the topic for a minute. And what do we do with all these methods <coughs> that we develop? <coughs> we take the methods we develop, and we package them up into accessible open source software for biologists and physician scientists. Um, we've been doing this since 2002. We have about a half a million users worldwide and about 30,000 citations. We have the gene pattern integrative analysis environment, which has been combined uh, into electronic notebooks to give people reproducibility of their studies. The integrative genomics viewer, which is, gives interactive exploration of genomic data sets and gene set enrichment analysis in the molecular signatures database, which um, I didn't talk about at all today. I will talk about it tomorrow and Wednesday. Uh, but that's probably um, our most heavily used um, software. And it's the thing that people use to try and figure out what processes, biological processes, are active in the particular tumor or disease that they're studying. So I stole this slide from Keith Yamamoto at UCSF. I love this slide. And he talks about how we're really at an inflection point in biomedicine. And I think that's what really makes it so exciting for somebody like me, uh, you know, a simple trained mathematician, to do this kind of work. Because we're really going from what Keith calls imprecise medicine, where you collect data and describe phenotypes, you treat diseases, into a more precise way of integrating all kinds of clinical and molecular data, elucidating mechanisms, treating patients as individuals. So treating patients rather than treating diseases. And to really do that, to do that kind of precision medicine, you really need mathematics and computation. It just has to be. The other thing I, I wanted to just share with you is how the treatment of cancer has changed over the years. Um, this, a version of this slide was, was actually first released, I think, by the AACR, um, the American Association for Cancer Research. And it had dates in it, but the dates kind of schmear into each other, so I, I, I like to show it without dates. But, you know, initially the way people treated cancer, like our friend Celsus, was to cut it out. Just cut it out. Um, it's especially true if you think about breast cancer and the way it was treated 30 or 40 years. They just cut everything out. Um, and then people began to explore radiotherapy. So if you've read um, about Henrietta Lacks's story, um, that's all about radiotherapy and uh, the side effects of radiotherapy and in our kids, the side effects of radiotherapy. Then. There was our friend Sidney Farber who figured out how to use traditional chemotherapy where you're basically just killing all the fast growing cells. Cancer is a fast growing cell and if I kill all the fast growing cells, I can cure that cancer. The problem is that there are other cells that are fast growing and um, there are a lot of side effects of chemotherapy, although chemotherapy has its successes. It, it should not be ignored. Then there's what people like to call precision or targeted therapy, which is what I've been describing to you, where you see that there's a particular process or pathway that's activated, and that's a target for a particular drug, which you know will inhibit that gene or that process or that pathway. And the newest kid on the block is really immunotherapy. 
And what immunotherapy is really about is the fact that let's leverage our immune system. Our immune system doesn't like foreign bodies in our body. So let's try and help the immune system help us, right, to fight the tumor and fight the cancer. And there's a lot of work going on in immunotherapy today. And often um, tumors that are targeted for immunotherapy are targeted because there's a particular variant or a particular activated pathway that's found in those tumors that people know <laughs> immunotherapy will work with. And the interesting thing is that if you look over here and you see here is the, this is actually a graph like I showed you before, a survival curve. This is actually for melanoma patients. Um, remember that picture I showed you initially, um, you know, of the great cure and then the great relapse? Um, not so great relapse. Uh, so here's conventional therapy, and you see it's like you don't save a lot of people <laughs> and lose even more. Now, immunotherapy right now doesn't really, it's not really successful in a lot of patients. However, the success is what we call durable. That is that people who respond to the immunotherapy seem to respond to it for a longer period of time. Now with targeted therapy, like I showed you in those pictures of melanoma, a lot of people respond, but then you kind of fall off the cliff a little bit. So a lot of work that's going on now comes from the idea, well, maybe we can combine therapies. Maybe we can combine immunotherapy with targeted therapy and raise this part of the immunotherapy graph and raise this part of the targeted therapy. And that's work that's going on now in a lot of labs. Probably here, also at UCSD, UCSF, all around the UCs. Okay, <laughs> excuse me. Um, so I just want to summarize by saying we are at this inflection point of going from observational medicine to molecular and personalized medicine. And so it's a very exciting time to work in this field. Machine learning and other computational approaches and mathematical approaches are key to integrate data, elucidate mechanism, build predictive models, identify candidate targets and compounds. And then to make all these approaches accessible to the research community, by the way, whether they program or not, you don't need to program to use any tool that comes out of my lab. I mean, we program, obviously, but you don't have to. And then the exciting thing is that these things are really beginning to translate into the clinic. And that's what's <coughs> really, really exciting to see, is to see what happens um, when work that you've done is actually applied to the clinic. You know, I talked about immunotherapy being an important new area of work and research, but I also want to say that one of the things about cancer, I think I have a couple minutes. No, I don't. Well, one of the important things about cancer is to catch it early. And so prevention and early detection are also key areas. And I don't know how many of you in this room, but usually when I speak to a room like this, almost everybody here has someone in their family or a friend or someone they know who's fallen to this disease. And if we can catch these things early, breast cancer is caught early now and can be treated. Pancreatic cancer, no such luck. Ovarian cancer, no such luck. We've got to find ways to cut these things off at the pass. And I just want to end you with this thought, which is that all of this is interdisciplinary work. And that biology, as we get more and more data, is going to make more use of mathematics and statistics and those of us who are mathematicians and computer scientists, it's incumbent upon us if we want to work and work effectively in this field to learn some biology.
That's, that's really key. And it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to cure cancer, a bigger village than this. But this is my village. And um, thank you all. And I hope you learned something today.